Okay, so I thought it would just be good to clear up some common misconceptions um, about improving executive function skills. So this is very informal. Obviously, I'm wearing a sweatshirt. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions at, at the end. Um, I just ask that you, uh, you know, keep the questions, you know, focused on uh, what we're going to talk about. Oh, good. Now I can see the comments, too. So we're good. All right. Excellent. Um, all right. So let's get started. Um, let me see if I can. OK, so. I just want to clarify executive functioning for you. So executive functioning is a is, is an umbrella term. Um, it's to describe the different processes that occur in the prefrontal cortex or the frontal lobe. So something I really want people to understand is that um, if you struggle with executive functioning, you know that, or I'm sorry, if you have ADHD. That is an executive function developmental delay. Somebody does not have ADHD and have good executive functioning. I recently had a parent tell me, well, my son has ADHD, but his executive functioning is good. And I said, then he doesn't have ADHD. So uh, just keep that in mind. And probably eventually it's ADHD is actually going to be called executive function developmental delay, which is actually a much more accurate term for it as well. Um, Dr. Hallowell has another term that I like. Uh, he, he's using coming out in his new book uh, called Variable Attention Stimulus Trait, which, which is interesting as well. So um, I also want to explain that while I specialize in ADHD, um, executive functioning challenges are not diagnosis specific. So if somebody has Asperger's and they struggle with executive functioning, you know, it doesn't look different than executive functioning challenges in somebody with ADHD. They're still going to have difficulty feeling time. They're still going to have difficulty, you know, with future things thinking skills, all these things. There's going to be other variables in there that's going to make it different, but I just want to, to explain that because sometimes people will say to me, well, you know, my son has Asperger's, my son has higher verbal autism, you know, will this work? And I say, yes, executive function, um, you know, challenges, they don't discriminate gender or diagnosis like that. Okay. The other thing I want to explain to you is that there is no such thing as executive dysfunction or executive function disorder. Those are not formal diagnoses. They're terms people started using for some reason. Um, I'm not saying they're inaccurate, but they're not diagnoses. All right. So you don't have to say that like my son or my daughter has ADHD and executive function disorder, right? Because again, if they struggle with executive function, if they have ADHD, then they struggle with executive functioning. Okay. So Let's talk real quick about what exactly a lagging executive function skills look like at home. Um, some of you have may have seen these slides before and I, you know, because I put this together in like an hour, I just decided this a few hours ago. Some of you may have seen these before. So uh, what do they look like at home? So prompt dependence, you know, having to be told every step what to do, brush your teeth, brush your hair, you know, uh, put on your shoes, put this in your backpack, take your lunch. So if you're, if you have to do that, that means that your son or daughter is prompt dependent. And I also want to mention, I'm probably going to say son a lot just so I don't have to keep saying son or daughter. But again, executive function challenges don't discriminate based on gender. Okay, uh, difficulty sustaining attention to non-preferred subjects or tasks. That's kind of the essence of you know ADHD. So I wouldn't expect your son to be able to spend it, you know, um, you know, have the same interest level in uh, washing dishes or you know unloading the dishwashers as he would in you know Minecraft or whatever he's into. Uh, difficulty feeling time is a concrete concept or lack and lack of a sense of urgency. All right. Uh, lack of situational awareness. So if your son or daughter's ever walked out into the room, I mean, I'm sorry, ever walked out um, into the street without looking, that's a lack of situational awareness. If they seem kind of lost when they go into unstructured situations, that's a lack of situational awareness. Um, difficulty transitioning from preferred tasks to non-preferred tasks. So like getting off video games without kind of, you know, exploding or getting upset or arguing. Oh, I actually have lack of situation awareness there twice. And I do call it, um, you know, often we call it reading a room. I call it with kids. I call it reading the field. All right. Um, recalling past information and applying it to the present or future and the emotions associated with those experiences. That's called episodic memory. So the way I describe this to kids, I say, think about your life as like a long YouTube channel. You can kind of rewind and look back on different parts of your life and how you felt about those things. Well, when somebody's brain works with ADHD, it makes it hard for their brain to do that unless there's typically a strong emotion attached to it. So a lot of times kids with ADHD will look like they don't remember how to do something they've done in, you know, in the past. And it's because of this. It's because they're not recalling that information from the past. OK. Or if, you know, they say, you know, I don't want to go bowling. And, you know, you said, well, you went a month ago and you loved it. It's because they're not remembering that they had a good time. Right. They're not remembering that emotion from it because it wasn't strong enough.
Okay. So what do ex uh, lagging executive function skills look like at school? So does homework, but doesn't hand it in. Um, unnecessary papers and trash in backpacks and binders. I found, you know, sandwiches from four months ago in the bottom of backpacks. Uh, difficult, difficulty with situational awareness in school would look like, um, you know, everybody takes out their math book because they switch from social studies to math and he's still sitting there um, with the social studies book. Uh, difficulty with writing assignments. So writing is all executive functioning, okay? The other thing I want you to understand is reading comprehension also requires executive functioning. I'm not really gonna get into that today, um, but if your son or daughter has difficulty with summarizing, kind of explaining themes, um, they tend to focus on small details that happen, you know, in a chapter, but have trouble with the bigger picture, that's the same kind of thing, okay? And with writing, it's because writing, you know, involves having to plan in your head, having to organize your thoughts, have, how to get it on paper so somebody else can understand it. Okay. Also, if they tell a story in a convoluted way, that's the same difficulty with executive functioning that um, you know we see with writing. Okay, uh, so procrastinating. Obviously, I'm going to talk about that. Um, thinks assignments will take much longer than they'll actually take. Um, does homework in the opposite order of, of the, what they should do. So a lot of times, what I'll see, not a lot of time, all the time, I see kids kind of wait for like, you know, writing until the end or they wait, they, they leave English until the end. And then that's when they're tired, their brain is tired and they don't have the energy for it. And that's when stuff not starts not to get done. Okay. And here's a big one we have to talk about, you know, completely disengaged in virtual learning. I want to tell you real quick before I move to the um, next slide. So last week, uh, what was it? Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I had the ADHD conference. I presented on Saturday. Um, and, and I really struggled with it this year because sitting here at my desk for, you know, between nine in the morning and five at night, um, you know, watching things on my computer, it was really not enjoyable. And I just thought a lot about the kids. I'm like, if I can't do this, how can we expect any productivity out of them with, with you know, virtual learning? So, all right. So something I want to explain to you. Teachers, school counselors, school social workers such as myself get little to no education in ADHD or executive functioning. So as a result, they often see executive function challenges as behavior issues. Okay, so there's this widespread misconception, um, you know, amongst parents as well as as you know um, educators that executive functioning means academic organizational skills. The other thing I want you to know is that some IEP goals and some, to a lesser extent, 504 plans, they're really not um, designed to help cultivate independence. Um, and what they actually do a lot is further enable prompt dependence. And the reason for this is because they're trying to cover themselves and avoid litigation. Okay. And, and it's sad that we, you know, we have to talk about it in that context, but really that's what it's about for school district. It's how do we cover ourselves to avoid litigation? So if that means keeping kids prompt dependent, you know, it is what it is. Um, I, I see there's 51 people here, but I only see a few in the chat box. So I just want to say hi real quick. Hi, Stacy. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Tara. Um, also, I'd like to know where everyone's from. So if you can just tell me where you're from, I'm, I'm always curious about that. Um, for kids in elementary school, okay, um, some of you have seen this, these, you know, behavior traffic lights. Some of you elementary school teachers might use these. Well, guess where kids with ADHD often wind up in here uh, on this here when they're off task, right? They often wind up in the warning or in the timeout, you know, piece because again you know if they have difficulty with situational awareness if they have difficulty um you know being with with writing or whatever it is you know they're going to seem off task or they might seem um they might distract other kids so you know often this looks like behavior issues okay so i'm going to go through a few different misconceptions here um i love seeing where everybody's from this is really cool wow <laughs> um Oh, wow. Sydney. Well, I saw Sydney and I saw I saw somewhere else out of the States. Where was it? Did I see the UK? I think. Yeah. Um, oh, Marielle. Hi. <laughs> Some local people as well. OK, uh, so misconception one, he gets executive function help in school. I hear this all the time from parents who um, live in the school district, whose kids attend the school district that I went through and my son went through. And, you know, what I explain is most likely what he is getting help with is academic organizational skills and receiving prompting, you know, and, and the reason I know that is because I know the school district very well. I know the teachers are not trained in executive functioning, but the school district knows that they're dealing with highly educated parents and they know the right terms to use. So they say they're getting executive function help. And most parents think, oh, okay, he is. Now we could say that's a 
type of executive function help, you know, but that's not really addressing kind of the foundational issues. Wow, New Zealand. Hi, Geraldine. Welcome. Um, okay. So here's one of the questions people ask me a lot is, you know, what accommodations are best for kids with ADHD? And here's what I say. There is no cookie cutter answer to this. Okay. It's all dependent on the kid. This is not my area of expertise, but I do want to tell you, um, I had a discussion with one of my colleagues this weekend who I think is going to start, uh, hopefully doing some work for me, some parent coaching. Um, and this is really her area. Um, this is, you know, she's really knowledgeable about this. So, so here's what I want you to ask yourself. Okay. This is kind of the question to determine if an accommodation is helpful. Is this helping him learn to be an independent learner and helping him to develop self-advocacy skills? So asking for help. Okay. Or is it further enabling his over-dependence on adults, often for the sake of grades? Self-advocacy skills is something that's really challenging for kids with ADHD. And again, that's you know an executive functioning piece. They're not always aware of how they're doing, but they're not always thinking about when they should ask for help because obviously that requires self-directed talk, okay? Things like kind of generic um, accommodations, sit, you, know, sit, you know, sitting in the front of the room, extra time on test, rubrics, those are all fine, okay? They're good because they're not enabling over-dependence. A resource teacher or whatever, learning support teacher handing you the day's homework instead of you writing it down, that's enabling over-dependence, okay? And I just wanted to kind of give you that com compare and contrast there. Okay, so um, how many of you just uh, give <laughs> type a... Uh, Type a letter T if you've ever tried the uh, time timer uh, or uh, reward charts or checklists like this, um, you know, or setting reminders on Alexa. OK, so what most parents tell me is these things work temporarily or they don't work at all. OK, the other thing I want to tell you, and I've never really talked about this in the group. OK, is, you know, the ADHD market is a very lucrative market. I mean, the ADHD, you know, medication industry is a billion dollar industry. OK, so it's no surprise that a lot of gimmicks come out to kind of capitalize on this market. You know, like uh, there's one you've I'm sure you've probably all heard of. It has to has the word brain in it that, you know, does brain training. You know, there's that vibrating uh, you know band right there, which is supposed to keep t kids to stay on task. Um, you know, for me, these things are gimmicks, okay? They're not going to help you develop skills, okay? And I don't even really see that they're, they're tools. So, so yes, a lot of you have tried these without results, okay? So what I ask about these things, are they helping you feel the passage of time? Are they helping you move from being prompt dependent to independent? Are they helping you to get off video games without fights or nagging, develop resiliency to get through non-preferred tasks, transition, um, you know, with, without blowups, get through daily routines without constant supervision and reminders, keep on track of assignments, so on. Okay. So, and most importantly, are these things learning, teaching kids how to use their executive functioning instead of you acting as your executive functioning? No, because they don't teach skills. All right. Misconception two. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, every week, do you have a course my son could watch to help him improve executive function skills? So here's what I want you to understand. Okay, in order for kids to improve executive function skills, parents need to change the way they use language and create the scaffolding to help improve executive function skills. Something else I want you to understand here is that, you know, most, and I've talked about this, most of my training, the work I use, does not come from the mental health field. It comes from the speech language pathology field. And one of the, I will tell you, I think, you know, in the ADHD field, you know, in which, you know, obviously coming more from the mental health angle is they really have no idea the importance of language, I have to tell you. Um, this is a tremendous gap that's missing in the ADHD field. And I'm just so grateful that, that I found the speech language pathology field when, when I did, um, because this has really kind of oriented me to the importance of language in this. All right, so you cannot stick a kid in front of a video and expect them to improve their executive function skills. All right, um, so here's, I want to break it down by age group. So, and I'm going to say for, because there's some people here internationally. So elementary school, we're talking about, you know, age, uh, you know, six to 11. So it's impossible to improve executive functioning without parents um, doing the above, okay? Parents have to create the scaffolding and the, use the right language for kids in that age group to improve their executive functioning. For middle school age, all right, um, I find not always, but sometimes kids need to be sold on strategies. And the way I sell it to kids is I say, if you can, you know, make your brain be flexible and, and use what I'm going to show you, it's going to give you more free time to yourself. And that's what I kind of teach parents to how to sell this in the uh, webinar series. Um, so kids in middle school, so age, you know, 11 to 14, they can learn on their own, 
but parents also need a full understanding of strategies um, and sometimes inflexibility needs to be dealt with okay one of the things i will tell you is for middle school kids like okay let me give you an example so today i saw uh, one of the guys from camp who's 12 and seventh grade um and i wanted to meet with him and and his mom together because these are things you know we have to you know figure out and work on together okay i don't expect him to do it himself he's not interested in this understandably so uh, for a high, I later than later today, I saw a high schooler who's 16 and with him, I just did this on his own because I know he's mature enough to be able to do that, but he's also academically motivated. So I don't really need to get his parents involved in it. All right. So I hope that clarifies things a little bit. All right. Misconception three. Is there a book you can recommend for my son to help with this? Moms, I really want you to listen to this. Okay. Newsflash, boys do not read books about topics that are not interesting to them. And if your husband or your son's father has ADHD, whether diagnosed or undiagnosed, they're most likely not going to read things that are not interesting to them either. OK, and, you know, so so boys in general don't read things that are not interesting to them. Boys with ADHD will definitely not read books about topics that are not interesting to them. The reason I bring this up is because all the years I was in, you know, ADHD Facebook groups, all I see is mothers telling other mothers to buy him this book, you know, buy him this book. And I'm like, no, you're wasting money. He's not going to read it. Can I tell you that I want to tell you the books and I'm sorry, I should have had a graphic for this. Here's the books I recommend to parents um, for elementary school. I like. Uh, Dr. Melmed's books, oh my God, I forgot what they're called, but I like Dr. Melmed's books about ADHD. They're kind of uh, written in the like diary of a wimpy kid in that style. And I think they just give, um, you know, a really nice introduction to it. Um, the only book I recommend for, you know, for elementary school and middle school kids really for, for boys is a puberty book called um, It's Perfectly Normal. And for high school kids, if they're, um, you know, if they're on the older end, uh, Leslie Josell's new book, which I, I should have the, the title right in front of me, but but I don't, um, but I, I really should. So um, I really like Leslie's book. I think it's very user friendly for, uh, you know, older high school kids and college students. That's who it's geared for. Um, and it's just very accessible. And I was really impressed with it. Um, I also want to tell you that I've read every executive function book out there designed for parents, and I would not recommend the strategies in any of them because they're not visual. And this generation learns visually and really to help develop these skills, things need to be made visual. Okay. So next one, misconception four. Uh, this is, I wanted to put this in here. Okay. Because I've been hearing this a lot, you know, we're not using meds. We're doing this holistically, or, you know, I haven't explored meds yet. So I'm going to be short and sweet about this. Okay. If you are choosing not to medicate your son or daughter, and it's been recommended, I want you to understand that they're not learning to the best of their ability. Okay. Depending on their profile of ADHD, their social relationships can be negatively affected. The strategies I teach will be minimally helpful at best. And the really important thing I want you to understand is that the research data shows that kids with ADHD who remain unmedicated are more likely to get into substance abuse problems. They're more likely to get into accidents. All right. So please, if you know, medication is something you've been scared of, do your research. Do not take advice from people on Facebook, you know, in parent groups, <coughs> excuse me. You know, ADHD meds are the most researched meds in the psychiatry field, and they're also considered the safest. And there's a profound amount of misinformation out there, you know, in online and, you know, in parent groups and, and so on. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize that graphic was on. Let me, hold on. Let me get rid of that. Um, all right. I'm going to hide that. Okay. Uh, next one. So uh, can I have a press the number one on your uh, keyboard or whatever you're on if you've ever said clean your room and you expect it to go from that to that, but it never happens, okay? I want to explain to you why that is, okay? Because this is executive functioning, all right? So the reason why that happens, oh, slide's not going, okay? Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll hear, you know, um, I'll hear parents say, uh, you know, my son has, you know, anxiety, so he can't clean his room. I'm finding the term anxiety is being overused a lot right now. Okay. Um, or they'll say, you know, my son has ODD because he refuses to clean his room. So what I want you to consider is, you know, um, and all of you who are typing in one right now. Okay. He can't visualize what the space should look like when it's clean, regardless of how many times you have prompted him to clean it. Okay. Because he or she doesn't know where to start or what sequence to clean. And because he has no concept of how long it will take, so he presumes it will take much longer than it will, okay? So for a kid with ADHD to see this um, 
right? There's, you know, in, unless they're being prompted, they don't know where to start, you know? They can't, and that most importantly, what I want you to understand is they can't visualize this, okay? So I teach this strategy in, what is it, webinar two, I think? Um, yeah, I think I, in webinar two, executive function crash course, I teach the strategy how to make this work for kids. And I've had a great success with it, okay? And, and I bring this I bring this up, okay, because, and some of you have heard me say this, I can't stand the term ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. Um, I think it's pathologizing. I think it's a description of, you know, behaviors that are based on inflexibility, sometimes in anxiety, a need for control, and it's not a standalone diagnosis. And I just don't like heaping labels upon labels on kids, okay? Um, all right. So how many of you have tried uh, these and, you know, hoping that this would help improve time management? Type A2, uh, if you will, please, so I can get a sense. So let me explain to you why these do not work. OK, you cannot learn how to feel time from a digital clock. The way we learn to experience time is through unit volume. So think about when you were in school and like you might be staring up at the clock, you know, waiting for a class to end because you were really bored and you watch like the big hand, you know, moving, you know, waiting for it to get to the bell to ring. Right. That's actually how you learn to get develop a sense of time. Okay. Now here's what complicates this for this generation. And here's the example I give, you know, when I was younger, cause I'm an only child, I'm obsessed with TV shows with big families still to this day. So, you know, my life would revolve around when the Brady Bunch was on. So I knew, you know, I had to plan about when I was going to do homework, you know, based on when the Brady Bunch was on, that doesn't exist anymore because kids can watch things right whenever they want. So there's no sense of having to plan their time around things that are enjoyable for the most part. Okay. So digital clocks cannot teach you how to feel time. A timer like this does not teach you how to feel time. And this certainly doesn't teach you how to feel time. This thing here is a fancy version of this, okay? I know it's tremendously popular. I know every person, every ADHD coach tells parents to get it. It doesn't teach you how to feel time. I would tell you don't get it. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Misconception four. And this is another one I have to tell you. I find moms have a lot of trouble, you know, kind of wrapping their heads around for some reason. Um, counseling can't help with executive. Oh, it's supposed to say counseling can't help with executive functioning challenges. So sorry about that. Again, I put this together in two seconds. All right. Um, I'm going to speak for myself. You know, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I went through graduate school. I, I never got any education in ADHD. I never heard the term executive functioning. Okay. It was never mentioned. Um, any training I did after that, you know, was never mentioned. Um, so, and, and even I have to tell you, I've worked at, you know, special ed school, schools that market for kids with ADHD. This is almost never mentioned. Okay. So, and you know, last year I decided, I said, you know what, I'm going to look in one of these, you know, popular therapy treatment planner books that help you, you know, develop therapy goals. So for ADHD, basically what it is, is hang up checklists, have them carry around a list, use timers, you, you know, so on. And obviously we know those things don't work. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to tell you about is, and I, I hadn't thought about this in years. Okay. When I was, um, I guess my, whatever, freshman in college, sophomore in college, 19 or 1920. And I was seeing a therapist and my executive functioning skills were not good. When, when I was younger, I was always late for class in college. And when I would see this therapist, I would be late to her sometimes, you know, and she would say, um, you know, so let's explore your resistance, you know, about why you're coming here late. You know, let's, what do you think that means? And I would be like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, because I genuinely like, wasn't kind of like hesitating coming. It was because my executive functioning, but what happens is because therapists don't understand this, they tend to create like these speculative narratives to give meaning to executive functioning challenges if they don't understand them, you know? So he's acting out because of this, or he's angry, you know, or he's not opening up yet. I've heard all kinds of things. I don't want to dwell on it because I think people get tired of me hearing this, okay? But you get the message, okay? But most importantly, here's what I want you to understand. Lagging executive function skills are a learning issue. They're not a mental health issue, which is why counseling is not going to address executive functioning challenges unless the person has gone out and sought training on their own you know like somebody like me or um some of the speech language pathologists in the group like miss arlene and mr mike miss sue all right so um misconception six uh, he waits until the last minute to do everything. So <laughs> it's not actually that he's waiting until the last minute. He can't think that far ahead into the future. And he forgets things if there's no strategies in place to help him improve future thinking skills. The other piece of this is he may not have a goal in mind of what the end result should look like. 
All right. So for instance, if I have to do a three page book report, you know, I have to picture, okay, what are the three pages going to look like? You know, kind of thinking what's going on each page. Am I going to have a cover? So <laughs> excuse me, if you have ADHD, you have difficulty, right, with that future planning. So that's going to make this difficult. All right. So kids with ADHD, they need to be able to see time spatially. This is a strategy I teach in webinar five. Okay. And really what it is, it's, it's learning to, I teach how to use one of these cheap desk calendars to help develop future thinking skills. Okay. You cannot do this on a computer. Technology cannot do this. This is actually what I went over with the 16 year old today. Um, you know, and I had to explain to him why, you know, looking up things or using his calendar on his iPhone is not going to work. We have to make things very easy to see spatially. Okay. And yeah, this is a strategy I cover in webinar five. So this is okay up here. This is how far somebody without ADHD can think into the future. Okay. And by the way, I see some of the questions and <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to ask you just hold them until the end. And by the way, I'm not sick. I just, when I don't drink enough, I get hot. It's really warm here actually. Um, so if you have a third grader, so that's eight to nine years old, they can basically think ahead eight to 12 hours. 12 to 16 year old can think ahead to the future two or three days. I might even say that's a little bit de debatable. Okay. So for somebody with ADHD, subtract two or three years from this. Okay. So a 12 year old, you know, they are not thinking ahead two days into the future. You know, they're thinking more ahead, maybe a day into the future. So when you have ADHD, your ability to think into the future is lower than what is shown here. Oh, sorry is lower than what is shown here, okay? That's what I want you to understand. And this comes from Sarah Ward, who um, I did most of my training with around executive functioning, um, you know, whose work has been the most influential on me. Okay, um, so let's talk about some things that do work. So we have to make time visual. We need to do visual scaffolding to build future thinking skills, whether it's that calendar, whether it's um, having my morning routine chart with kids that would have pictures of themselves going through their morning routine. It's incentivizing getting through non-preferred tasks with little rewards. So with the 12-year-old I worked with today, what we you know came up with was when he gets through his writing homework, because that's hardest for him, then he's going to have a break. And his bigger reward for getting through all his subjects was going outside. Um, we have to use visual and declarative language. Vi visual language helps to develop those future thinking skills. Declarative language helps to develop um, self-directed talk or what I call brain coach with kids. So uh, you can watch on my YouTube channel, my ADHD Dude Live with Linda Murphy, who wrote the declarative language handbook. And I strongly recommend that to you as well. It's a very short read. It's easy to read. Linda, I think, is actually doing a class. Yeah, she is. She's doing a class now to help parents develop that more. That's, so when I talk about using language to improve executive functioning, that this is where I got it from. OK, I'm, I'm sending you to the source, so to speak. OK, we have to apply if then thinking to teachable moments, you know. So if you do this, then then this is going to happen. You know, we have to do previewing or, or front loading. So letting them know what's coming up and what to expect. Um, and we have to make a commitment to stop acting as his or her executive functioning and, and allow allow for some stumbling and allow for some natural consequences as well. And what I will tell you is the parents who I know are going to have the, the hardest time or the kids who are going to have the hardest time are the ones whose parents say, I can't allow him to fail. And what I say to them is in the nicest way possible, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're setting him up for failure because that's the truth. If you keep acting as your kid's executive functioning, you're guaranteed to set them up for failure. Okay. They have to develop these skills. Um, and the sooner, the better. It's never too late, but the sooner you know we work on this, the better. Okay. So misconception five, you know, he doesn't care about rewards. He's not motivated by things. He doesn't use the checklist we have. Well, checklists do not help you visualize yourself doing a task in the future. And the other thing with this is in regards to a checklist is carrying out a task often happens in a different physical space than when you're planning to do the task. Okay. Now I want you to think back to this for a minute. Okay. What parents do a lot, I see, is they have like, you know, a reward on Friday. So you finish all your homework, you know, all week, and then you'll have extra Xbox time on Friday. Well, here's the deal. That's too far ahead in the future. They can't, on, on Tuesday, they can't think ahead to Friday. So what happens is parents have good intentions, but the time horizon in which they put the incentive is way too ahead in the future. So these rewards have to be immediate to help develop that motivation. OK, and again, this is what I teach in webinar two, um, helping to learn to get through non-preferred tasks. OK, 
So list, as I said, lists do not work for most kids with ADHD. Um, lists are not visual. So if you can't see yourself doing the task, it's going to be difficult for you to execute the task. Now, I do see some kids, okay, who can get through their morning routines just fine because they're motivated to or whatever. I don't really understand why it is that some can and some can't, but it just is what it is. All right. So these things do not work. All right. Stop using them if you're using them, please. All right, so real quick, because this is not an infomercial, um, executive function crash course for parents, five webinars, $20 each. What I suggest is go at your own pace with them. Start with one, okay, and get yourself familiar with the language. Start using it. You can read reviews on the ADHD Dude Google business page if you want. Over 2,000 families have participated in this now. Um, the other thing I want to mention real quick is that um, if you go to this, this page, you're going to see a lot will say sold out. Every webinar is available. You just have to scroll through the sold out ones. And in another month or two, I'm going to actually be getting rid of this and I'm switching to a uh, subscription service. So um, everyone who wants to have access to all my webinars will be able to go to one place and get them. And you know, you can cancel at any time. So that's what's coming up. I have a one-time webinar here. Um, so applying the strategies from executive function crash course to virtual learning. So what I cover in there is, you know, how to be proactive about presenting, preventing skill regression, um, you know, how to explain this to your son or daughter's teachers, how to create the scaffolding to make virtual learning more tolerable, um, some sensory input strategies to help with, with focus. So, so what I'm going to, I just want to be really clear about this. You know, this is not to say this is going to help your son or daughter um, suddenly become more productive and, and get all A's, but it's going to make virtual learning more tolerable for them. That was the intention with this. All right. Okay. So real quick, obviously you're here, please. You know, I have a YouTube channel, Instagram, all that stuff. Um, on the right here is my attitude magazine page. If you type in ADHD and boys, you'll find it. Um, you know, where I have articles as well as videos. I, I guess that's the only place my articles are besides, yeah, the Facebook page. All right. So uh, coming up soon, uh, my next webinar series, Raising Great Dudes, which is going to be a parent behavior training program. Um, forgot a parenthesis there. And uh, I'm finishing up. I'm going to have three versions of that. I'm going to have elementary school, middle school, and high school. Some of it is going to be connected, but I want to really specify different ages for this because all the parent behavior programs out there I've seen, they tend to not do that. Okay. And that's important to me. And like I mentioned, I'm going to have a subscription service coming out. There's going to be all my webinars there. I'm going to have office hours several times a month where we can do this and I'll answer your questions. All right. So um, thank you all so much. I am happy to answer questions. So I'm going to kind of go backwards a little bit here. Um, oh, OK. So let's let's see. Uh, so Nancy said, how do you feel about an executive function coach, not a therapist? So Nancy, I'm glad you asked that. Here's what I want everybody to understand. OK that coaching is an unregulated field, meaning you can't be licensed, you can't be a licensed coach that doesn't exist. There are phenomenal ADHD coaches out there. Um, there are ADHD coaches out there who have participated in intensive two-year training. Um, there's some who have taken an online course for a few hours and call themselves a coach. So that's the, that's the issue is because it's an unregulated field, you know, it's really hard to be an educated consumer and know, you know, who's legit and who's not because of this. Um, what I will tell you is, you know, the, the coaches who I think, who I see do good work are the ones who just specialize in, you know, kids or just specialize in adults. The problem I see a lot is coaches who don't really understand how to work with kids. Or I'll give you an example. In one of the sessions from the, um, you know, the ADHD conference, I saw a coach say, you know, I'm trying to, you know, work with a 14 year old, but he's resistant to everything. Well, this person probably doesn't, you know, really have much of a background, you know, in, in, you know, this stuff to understand that, you know, the flexibility piece or maybe how to work with kids. So I would say if you're interested in going that route, ask really, really specific questions. Okay. Ask how are they going to make the strategies visual? Um, you know, because yeah, you have to be a really educated consumer if you want to hire an ADHD coach. All right. Uh, going up a little bit. Uh, uh, Lauren asked, will we be able to rewatch this? Yes, absolutely. Melanie said, which Dr. Melmed? Uh, Melanie, it's Dr. Ron Melmed. If you, his name is spelled uh, R-A-U-N, and then you spelled his last name right, M-E-L-M-E-D. Has a series of books um, you can find on Amazon for, for younger kids. Um, okay, any other questions that I can answer? I'm just kind of scrolling up here. Uh, by the way, I don't see them as, as you're seeing them. 
Um, because, yeah, the feed is like a little slow, kind of, or the way I'm seeing it is a little slow. So, yeah, it's going to take me a minute to see some of your questions. All right. Uh, so, Michelle said, does pragmatics help middle schoolers? I'm not sure what you mean by that, Michelle. Um, so, if you know, Michelle, I don't know if you're talking about like social pragmatics. That has to do with the way we use social language. Um, and that's kind of a different thing than, than I'm talking about here with executive functioning. That's um, more, you know, about, about language. So, uh, language in terms of social language. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I'm going to defer that to, and, and really, you know, we can, that's kind of a broad question. I can't say it'll help. It, well, it depends. Do they have pragmatic language issues? Well, hope, yeah, if they do, then yes, it should help. Okay. But not your average kid who's, who doesn't have language issues. All right. Um, any other questions anybody can think of? Let's see. Uh, um, I'm going, I'm scrolling back over the, uh, actually the, the Facebook page here because of how slow this loads. All right. So I am going to, uh, oh, wait, one more. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Kara said, Ryan, thank you. Please don't underestimate the immeasurable value of happiness that returns to the relationship, um, when your executive function strategies are applied. And Kara, thank you for saying that because, um, I really appreciate that because, you know, here's my whole thing with the executive function webinar series. I, I do, I did that because I want to make life easier at home for people. And I wanted to do it in the most cost effective way possible. So just so those of you who are new, um, a half an hour session with me is a hundred dollars. You can get five webinars, like five hours of content for a hundred dollars. So yeah. Um, so Jennifer asked, do you have strategies for building reading comprehension skills? Um, Jennifer, excellent question. I am not a reading specialist, so I'm going to stay far away from, from that one um, because that is such a specialized field. Um, you know, and also that's something that speech language pathologists can, can help with as well, particularly when it comes to infancy. My son needed a lot of help with that. So I made my son see a speech language uh, pathologist through 12th grade. Didn't like it, but I don't care. <laughs> so um, he needed it. Uh, Danny asked ADHD versus LD. Why do educational assessments not count ADHD as a legit executive function disorder? So Danny, ADHD is an executive function developmental delay. A learning difference is not a neurodevelopmental challenge. It's a learning difference. They are two separate things. Um, and obviously they go hand in hand a lot. You know, they're, that's very common, but they are two separate things. Yeah. All right. I can do one more question because I see people are fading. <laughs> um, also, if you want to watch a little video on the executive function crash course, you can go to my website. Um, where's my website? Graphics, caption, ADHDdude.com to, to check it out. It's pretty easy to remember, I guess. All right. So uh, Bree asked, um, will I still benefit from the executive function webinar even though my son is 17? Good question. So Bree, what I would say is, yes, you'll absolutely benefit from it. Your son has to buy into using the strategies. You know, and what I would say is that the visual parts you watch with him to show to show him so he can understand what I'm talking about and the reason for them, because I find it works better if the kids hear me talking about it rather than you trying to explain it to them. Um, and again, you know, the whole idea with this is this is going to make your life less stressful and give you more time to yourself. OK, um, Vanessa said you only focus on boys. So, Vanessa, for executive functioning, emotional regulation, this is not gender specific. I focus on boys of, in regards to the social skills stuff because nobody else in the world that I know of does that. So, yeah, all of this stuff is not just for boys, but my social skills stuff is. Um, and, and really, you know, I've, you know, basically always you know, I've mainly worked with boys. So um, hi, Margo in Australia. Uh, let's see. Um, Angela said, any suggestions for dealing with cognitive inflexibility in the moment when the kid is stuck? Yeah. So what I would tell you, Angela, is if he's stuck, then he can't learn and he can't hear in that state. And that's when parents start getting sucked into the reasoning vortex or the argument vortex, meaning they get sucked into this, this pointless conversation that's going to go nowhere. Give him space, let him get unstuck. Okay. And then revisit it later. And that, you know, sometimes that might not be the same day. Sometimes you have to let things go and things don't get done. You know, um, can we get a list of the books you mentioned, please? Uh, Margo. So basically it's the declarative language handbook, Dr. Melmed's books for younger kids. Um, and Leslie Josel's book for older high school kids and college age kids. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I think uh, that's it. Thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate you uh, sticking around for this. I didn't realize I was going to go for 40 minutes, but thanks a lot. Hope this is helpful, um, and I will talk to you soon. Have a good night or a good day for those of you in Australia. Take care. Bye-bye.